Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Thank Judy. You for joining us, John. Seeing a lot of a uh, lot of familiar faces. Oh, Julia, hi. Good morning. It's really there good to see everyone. Deb. Cheryl, Kathy, Chris, Paula, this is great. Thank you all for being here on this beautiful morning. We're just going to let everyone get connected. Um, and as you may have already noticed, everyone is muted as they enter. So we'll kind of go over how this will be set up, but really grateful to see you all. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all for getting uh, getting settled here. Really awesome to see so many uh, wonderful people. Thank you. Good to see you, Commissioner Rubio, um, and others, of course. Um, It's like most people are connected to audio. We're just getting the last few people here. Oh, there we go. Commissioner Myron. Well, great. Thank you all for being here this morning. Um, there'll be some people filtering in, of course, uh, with their coffee. Um, uh, be before we get started, I'm gonna ask Lauren uh, and Maida to do some um, kind of how um, some introductory remarks as we as we prepare for this morning session. Hi everyone. Oh, there you go. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Maida. I am chief of staff for Representative Reynolds and uh, I'll be monitoring all of the questions. So if you have any uh, questions for the speakers or the guests, um, please feel free to forward them my way, and I will pass it over to Lauren uh, to talk real quickly and do the land acknowledgement. Yes, thank you, Maida. Everybody, I'm Lauren, Representative Dexter's Chief of Staff. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. I know it's nice out, so thank you for being inside and having this important conversation. Um, as Maida said, if you have questions, go ahead and forward them to her. Her name is Staff2 in the chat if that is an option for you. And I am going to begin with our, our land acknowledgement. We want to, um, Portland is seated on the traditional lands of the Clackamas, Grand Ronde, Yali, Tualatin, Wasco, Cowlitz, Clackamas, and Kalapuya lands. Indigenous people have and continue to play a significant and impactful role in shaping the city and the world that we live in today. We acknowledge and celebrate their contributions and hope to work together to rebuild trust and partnership with these communities. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Representative Reynolds. Thank you, good morning. Uh, we are here today to discuss uh, gun violence prevention. And I thought um, I would like to take a moment uh, just for all of us to take a moment of silence. There are so many victims of gun violence and today we wanna take particular time to acknowledge um, those who have died by gun violence in Portland. So I'm gonna offer a moment of silence. Uh, here are the names up on the screen, thank you. Um, thank you all for that. And thank you to the um, district attorney's office for uh, providing this, this list of names. Thank you, Representative Reynolds. Lauren here again, everybody. We're gonna 
We know that this topic that we're gonna talk about today is complex and difficult. So we just ask that everyone remains respectful of each other and of our wonderful guest speakers that we have with us today. We will remove any individual messages that display particularly aggressive mannerisms or words. The chat is temporarily closed. Uh, you can still message the hosts privately and the hosts are myself, Maida, Representative Reynolds and Representative Dexter. We will open the chat in the Q&A section later. Um, here are our group agreements that if you continue to be here today, all things that we should agree on in order to have a successful and uh, productive discussion. So first, share the air, move up and move back. Please acknowledge that there are a large number of people today, we're excited for that, but that everyone needs to have time to share if they would like to do so. Uh, number two, come from a place of wonder and curiosity. Um, this is a learning experience for us all. We're all here today because we have questions or we are curious about this topic. So please come from a place of, um, of questioning and wanting to know more. Number three, trust intent and honor impact. Uh, please remember that as we have these conversations that they might be difficult and something that someone else says might not resonate with you or might impact you in a difficult or challenging way, please just trust that what they are saying is meant to further our discussion together, but we also want to honor the impact of the words and how they made you feel. So the final, fourth and final is we really welcome and I don't know about that. If we mention something that you don't know about, please let us know. We always want to ask questions and learn more. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Representative Dexter and Representative Reynolds. Um, thank you this morning again. Thank you all for being here. Um, I want to acknowledge our uh, special guests and um, uh, folks we will be hearing from this morning. Um, Lakayana Drui from the community-based organization Word is Bond, Multnomah Multna County uh, District Attorney Mike Schmidt, Multnomah County Sheriff Mike Reese and City Commissioner Carmen Rubio. Uh, really um, honored that you're taking time out of your busy schedule to be here today. We have at least two more electeds who are joining here today, Multnomah County Commissioner Sharon Myron and Multnomah County Commissioner Lori Stegman. Uh, we'll be look, um, thank you for being here and uh, um, would love your, your thoughts on this topic as well. Look, we, you know, I want to acknowledge that that gun violence and gun violence prevention is a huge topic. We could probably have, we could easily have a week long seminar on this. Um, you know, gun violence claims the lives of 100 Americans, over 100 Americans every day. Um, and as we close out Domestic Violence Awareness Month, uh, I think it's also important to note that 57 women a month are killed in the United States uh, in intimate partner violence, killed by guns. Um, every month in the United States. And I do wanna take a moment to reflect on uh, the roles of guns in suicide. Oregon in particular has a very high rate of gun deaths that are due to suicide. Uh, in Oregon for the past many years, 80% of gun deaths were, um, were by suicide. And this is much higher than the national number, which is about you know, 60 to 65%, about two thirds of gun deaths nationwide. Um, we could, that could be a whole other topic, but I just wanna um, note that there are some laws in place uh, aimed to, to protect people from gun suicide. And part of what we do as gun violence prevention advocates is make sure people know the services and laws that are available to us. Oregon has passed the extreme risk protection order, which means that if a family member or law enforcement officer knows of someone who is at danger of harming themselves or others, they can file what's called um, kind of a gun restraining order in, in the court and the guns will be removed from that person. Um, there's also due process uh, available for that person as well. Uh, and also um, most recently in the state of Oregon, um, the legislature after years of trying and years of work that I personally did on it, uh, we passed safe gun storage. So this means that guns must be locked when not in use. This will be particularly important um, when people are in crisis to separate people in crisis from the lethal uh, means of a gun. We know that, that this law will save lives 
Um, it's, it's been an act. It's, I think this is the one month anniversary of when it, maybe the five week anniversary of when it, when it went into account. Um, I also, I'm going to ask Maida to put in our chat, if you or anyone you know is, is in crisis, we have a local um, suicide prevention hotline with Lines for Life. There's also national suicide numbers for this as well. Um, on that note, I'm going to turn it over to my, um, my amazing colleague, uh, Representative Maxine Dexter. Good morning. Thank you so much, um, Representative Reynolds, and thank you all for joining us. I am deeply grateful to our guests um, from Portland and Multnomah County for spending their morning with us as well to discuss this really incredibly important topic and how it impacts our city. Portland is in crisis. We have just surpassed our city's highest number of gun homicides sustained in a year at more than 70. More than 70 people who had families, hopes, dreams, and fears have lost their lives violently at the hand of someone with a gun. Many people, some of you, have shared with us your concerns about the state of our city. This increase in gun violence has been a top concern for many of us. We also recognize we are in a housing crisis, and all of this is with the pers persistent and sometimes overwhelming impacts of COVID-19. These issues are connected. We are seeing income disparity more than we've ever seen since the Great Depression, the perpetual uncertainty and stress we are all experiencing must be having an impact. And Portland is not alone. Gun violence has increased across the country and at a national level, we are finally starting to allow data collection to be funded and to do research about this with public dollars. The CDC once again, once did the, these kinds of studies until 1997 when the NRA convinced Congress to cut all CDC funding for gun research. It was a loss of equivalent to millions of dollars a year. In 2018, then President Donald Trump signed a government spending bill that allowed the CDC to conduct gun violence research. And in 2020 and 2021, Congress agreed to millions of dollars for gun violence research for the first time in decades. 25 million has been split between the CDC and the US uh, National Institutes of Health. Dr. Rochelle Wolowski, Wolinski, sorry, the CDC director has been really outspoken about our need to address this. And in Portland, we also have been outspoken about this. Statistics from Portland police show that shooting incidents started in January of 2019, prior to recognizing COVID-19. And we see there were gradual increases that rapidly accelerated over the last two years in this pandemic. We understand that disinvestments in our communities lack of recreation space, um, supportive programs uh, for at-risk youth, and many other interventions um, that have lost funding over the years have correlated with higher rates of gun violence. This is a public health issue, but it is not an, un an inevitable one. Gun violence is contagious and can come, become an epidemic as it has in Portland. It has disproportionate impacts on young adults, males, and those from underrepresented minorities, the BIPOC community. And we can see that in the sobering list of people that we shared at the beginning who have been killed this year, that is reflected. Mm -hmm. We cannot become dismayed and hopeless. We must take action. Gun violence can be, has been prevented through a comprehensive public health approach. And we are here today to help learn about how it's impacting our city and how we can move forward. Representative Reynolds and I have talked about this pretty extensively and, and with our guests and with you all, we do hope to understand whether there's support for moving forward with a public health approach, including starting with data, transparently reporting gun related deaths and injuries as the DA's office has been doing, understanding the causes and objectively assessing the impacts of um, the interventions that we as a city and a county, as an estate, um, create. Secondly, we need to identify the driving risk factors for gun violence, as well as the resilience and protective factors that guard against it. Third, we should develop, implement, and evaluate interventions that reduce risk factors and build resilience. We're not in this alone. This is happening across the country and we can apply best practices. And finally, we need to institutionalize the successful prevention strategies we have implemented or others have implemented and spread, spreading what works across the region. 
I'm sincerely grateful to our guests and our presenters, and I look forward to our discussion. And with that, I'll go back to Representative Reynolds. Thank you. Um, thank you, Representative Dexter. I'm going to just give a, a few minutes of, of context of, of what's happened so far in this front, and then we'll be turning it over to our guests. I'm getting, I'm already getting tired of myself. <laughs> um, but thank you. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, I think so many of us can remember, you know, where we were after the mass shooting at Sandy Hook School, and certainly for um, for me, as a, a mother of two young sons at the time, it was a, it was a, you know, it was a wake up call, even though I'm fully well aware that there are many, many communities who have been um, devastated by gun violence long before Sandy Hook. And I think a lot of people have said when the federal government, when our, when our Congress failed to act after that, you know, things felt pretty hopeless. And indeed, um, in the, uh, in, in the, in the time since the Sandy Hook shooting, there's been no meaningful federal action on gun violence prevention. The last meaningful federal action on gun violence prevention was the assault weapons ban in 1994, which um, expired in 2004 and has not been renewed. So it's up to us in the states, and this has certainly been a focus of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense, which is uh, where I first began, became involved in this issue and where I met so many people who are here on this, um, in this meeting this morning. Um, and so states really have become the laboratories of democracy in passing effective gun violence legislation. And Oregon is, is, is in that batch of, of states. I mentioned earlier the extreme risk protection order um, and, uh, and the, recent, um, the recent passage of safe gun storage in Oregon. Oregon has a, a very strong background check system in terms of uh, that every transfer of guns, uh, almost every transfer of guns has to be, um, has to go through a background check model. And so, um, but Oregon has a long way to go still. And we will we'll talk in the future about ghost guns legislation, closing the Charleston loophole, uh, in, uh, improved uh, restrictions for concealed carry permits. Um, and we know that um, gun laws do work in states that have stronger laws for gun violence prevention, there, it, there are lower rates of gun deaths. So California, which has among the strongest gun laws in the country, has about two thirds of the per capita, uh, per capita gun deaths compared to Oregon. Of course, uh, we have amazing city and county leaders who we will be hearing from today. Um, the Office of Violence Prevention at the city level and programs that are happening at the county level, um, as well as innovative ways that our, our sheriff and our DA are looking at this, at this problem. And then community-based programs. Oh my gosh, I'm very honored to have Lakayana Drury here to talk about his work and the work that's happening in the community. What I'm really calling the, the upstream or what Representative Sanchez calls the upriver approaches um, to gun violence prevention. And there's a lot of uh, wonderful work being done in our community. So without further ado, and, we, and we'll be talking about all this more, um, but without further ado, I'd like to turn the stage, so to speak, over to um, our wonderful city commissioner, Carmen Rubio, who uh, is, uh, is triple scheduled today. Um, so she will not be able to stay for the whole event, but I uh, would love to um, give her the floor now to talk about her perspective on gun violence prevention in Portland. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you so much, uh, Representatives Reynolds and also Representative Dexter for inviting me to be here today. I'm, I'm so um, happy for the invitation. Um, and uh, it's just a very important topic. And so I definitely wanted to be here to share some thoughts. Um, and um, also thank you to uh, everyone else on the panel. It's great to see everyone today. Um, so I'll just open by saying that, you know, what's happening right now um, is absolutely heartbreaking and it's really fair for people to have, um, you know, to be uh, frustrated, um, to have questions. Um, this is a really, really challenging time for our community. And I wish, especially for those families in our community that have been directly impacted um, and the neighbors and neighborhoods um, that we could solve this problem overnight. Um, but the truth is we, we can't. Um, this, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, taken uh, years and, and decades of neglect um, about, you know, the challenges that we have and the disparities and we have in our communities to um, uh, arrive at this critical point where we have to make very critical decisions. Um, but what we can do is work faster. And I believe that we can work faster, we can work more collaboratively with other jurisdictions and with the community without compromising our vision 
uh, for a more collab uh, a more accountable community safety systems that Portlanders have asked for, one with a holistic public health approach to community safety. And we can do that, um, and especially when we're working in collaboration with community. And it's a critical, it's critical that we recognize all these upstream determinants, prevention and community supports that should be integrated, um, not simply added, but integrated into a system of what we're doing now. And many ask me about why this is happening now and, and, and uh, that all the data that we heard was so um, important for framing and understanding all the, all the factors um, and all the separate issues in, in play uh, simultaneously. And the fact is there's not any one thing that, you know, as we heard that we can point to specifically, um, but um, what we do absolutely know is that for a very long time, we have not had the social safety net we need to help families and individually individuals be successful. Poverty, economic inequality, and a lack of opportunities are big challenges um, and layer on systemic racism, add in the global pandemic that shut our, down our schools, our social activity, and our economy. All these are reasons why we are experiencing or contribute to, the, to why we're, we're seeing what, what we see today. And this is why any work that we do must accompany long-term work to, cor to correct these decades of disinvestment and underinvestment in, in all of these vulnerable communities, our community. Um, so what we're working on and what I'm doing specifically and what I'm working on with um, some of my colleagues at city council, um, there are several actions that we've taken. We took um, an action this spring, um, back in April, we made significant investments in community organizations working hard on the ground with the credibility in the community that can help to de-escalate de situations and also prevent more gun violence um, by building uh, relationships and uh, programs and addressing root causes of, of, of um, challenges with the community and building trust. And we're also working with the Office of Violence Prevention to create more capacity for new um, and more organizations and individuals doing this work to be a part of this work. Um, we don't uh, nearly have enough capacity that we need. And, uh, or I actually I should say, the city has not historically supported bringing in more capacity uh, to, to, to meet uh, the threshold of what we truly need. So we are in the process of helping to build up that capacity from the city side because it is critically important. Um, and these are important investments because these organizations work um, with individuals directly um, some involved in violence um, and that can help them choose a different way forward, um, can help address other, other issues that they're working on, can work with families, um, can work with neighborhoods and friends. And I'm talking about work that is critical to breaking uh, the cycle of violent crime. And I've also long supported the expansion of Portland Street Response. And that is also another critical um, part of this conversation in terms of um, developing a, a, a holistic public health response um, and a de-escalation response to those struggling with mental illness. And we'll soon have a vote um, to fund that expansion in the coming weeks that I'm very excited about. Um, Commissioner Hardesty has done a tremendous job over the years uh, building this program, and we're very excited to see it um, moving forward. And it's a tremendous step forward for our city. Uh, and there's also more that we can do. Um, in the la uh, last uh, several weeks, we've also really sped up our efforts um, to better understand how we can reduce the strain in our 911 system. We have systems that are that are not um, uh, calibrated to what we need in this time. Um, and there are, you know, in, in, in terms of improving police staffing, as you know, there are negotiations happening right now about greater accountability and transparency, um, and also investing in body-worn cameras. Um, and not every 911 call requires a police response, and we need to be uh, better at sorting out those uh, that do from those that do not. And we're working very uh, collaborative, collaboratively right now, um, together with my colleagues, uh, with some of my colleagues, um, with Director uh, Mike Myers, uh, with Chief Flavelle and uh, looking cooperatively together to look at the structure of the police bureau, um, the recruitment of new and diverse officers that reflect the racial and linguistic diversity of Portland with a community-centered orientation, 
Um, and then the different roles um, of officers working together in combination with uh, programs, uh, differentiated response programs like Portland Street Response and um, the so social service providers uh, to create a better holistic safety system. Um, and how these uh, systems then cooperate systemically with other parts of the safety system, including uh, community-based solutions. So um, in closing, um, I, I believe that we can respond, to, we can respond to, to gun violence and also make changes to our community safety system uh, that Portlanders also want. Um, it's, it's a critical time right now and it's not an either or question. We can do both and I'm committed and we'll continue uh, to respond to the needs of today while holding the goals of where we want um, to go as a community together. And it does require, it's not just the city, it's, it's um, not just the state, it's not, it, we all have to work together in combination to address these at root causes and to really build um, the, the, the healthy community that we all want and, and need. And today is an, a great example of that happening. We have to be having conversations. We have to be sharing information and listening so that we can make sure that we calibrate the right uh, responses and approaches for Portland and for Oregon. So um, again, I'll, I'll stop there, but I just wanna say thank you so much for the conversation. I would love to come back um, maybe in a few months uh, or you know whenever you have the, the um, table set again so that we can continue talking about um, ways to make progress on our, our goals here. So thanks again for inviting me to have a, uh, to have a few minutes and have a have a great conversation. Um, thank you, Commissioner Rubio. I'm going to go a little. I'm going to ask Commissioner Rubio a, a question, and I'm going a little out of order because um, uh, Commissioner Rubio is going to have to leave in a few minutes. But as um, as as your role as a commissioner puts you in charge of uh, Portland Parks and Rec, uh, and um, I won't call you Leslie Note, but it's certainly tempting. <laughs> but one thing, you know, there's a really fascinating study referenced in the New York Times recently uh, about Philadelphia, that as they took some of the more, um, the neighborhoods that had been neglected and, uh, you know, took, took vacant lots and made them into gardens and rehabbed, um, rehab buildings that had been boarded up, gun violence went down by 29%. And um, it certainly made me think in, in conjunction with, you know, how we know the heat dome uh, had a larger impact in areas with fewer green spaces. I'm, I'm wondering how Portland Parks and Rec is, is looking at, the, at this in terms of long-term planning, you know, more parks are, are better, of course, and, and how this is um, playing out in the long-term planning. Well, uh, this is serendipitous um, that you bring that up because today is Arbor Day. And then shortly after, uh, where my next, where I'm headed next is actually um, to, uh, you know, celebrate our day in Parks and Rec with at Lentz Park, where we're talking specifically about the need to address, um, or to, for more green spaces and more tree canopy in, particularly in East Portland, because as you know, there's been decades of disinvestment in those communities. And so that is clearly where my focus is as Parks Commissioner, is to make sure that we do everything we can to um, correct that disinvestment and to um, address those things. Um, and so over the, the next several months, we're going to be planting 700 trees um, through the or urban forestry um, program. And we're gonna be joined out there this morning uh, with Commissioner Pham, who's going to, who also a big champion of this. Um, and I agree, we need green spaces because they bring healing, they bring, um, community together and, and community coming together brings safety. And it means safety uh, in, our, in our cities, in our neighborhoods, when community comes together. So um, that is my clear vision and focus. And we are very much a part of the conversation with Director Myers um, and my colleagues about, um, and I'm forgetting the term, uh, and also uh, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability about how um, exactly what you said, like safety, um, designing for safety and designing for community to come together in spaces where we need, we need more of those, um, those areas uh, that are with just a few thousand dollars, um, we can uh, make more accessible and, and make it a place where, where, where community is present and engaged. So uh, really, really great thoughts and would love to, to talk to you and share uh, more information with you um, as it develops. Great. Thank you so much, Commissioner Rubio, for all you do. Thanks. And of course, for being here this morning. Great. Thank you so um, much again for the invitation. Thank you.
Uh, um, I'm honored to introduce our next guest, Multnomah County Sheriff Mike Reese, who is, uh, who's a leader who I got to know through my work with Moms Demand Action. Um, and then uh, he was a, a great resource too, as I was contemplating a run for office. Um, so uh, definitely uh, a, a friend in this work. So um, take it away, Sheriff Reese. Thank you for being here. Well, it's an honor to be here, Representative Reynolds and Representative Dexter. Thank you so much for hosting this really important conversation. And I'll just give you a, a brief background on me so that you have a little context about where I'm coming from. I've uh, spent 30 years now in service to our community as a public safety professional. I grew up here in Portland, attended Roosevelt High School in St. John's and uh, Mount Hood Community College and then Portland State University. Worked uh, for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Portland where I saw the value of connecting kids to positive resources and uh, keeping kids that were on the margins out of uh, gangs and uh, having a positive adult role models and uh, resources that they need for better and healthier lives. And then uh, worked as a deputy sheriff from 1989 uh, until 1994 when annexations happened in the uh, center of our vast urban area that the sheriff's office patrolled, transferred to the city of Portland then and worked my way up to where I was chief of police for four and a half years. It's an honor to be here and I'm really looking forward to this conversation about gun violence. It is an important conversation. Um, unfortunately, the violence we're seeing right now is eroding away the sense of safety and security in many of our neighborhoods. And in some places it's, it feels like a tale of two Portlands. For those of us that may live in safe neighborhoods, primarily on the west side of Portland, southwest Portland or northwest Portland. We're not touched by what's happening in downtown and on the east side. And in many of those neighborhoods, gun violence is a daily occurrence. That map that the Oregonian did that showed where these events are happening, over a thousand shootings in the city of Portland, 72 homicides. It really paints a really stark contrast of how these Portlands are playing out. We have to acknowledge that many people, our BIPOC community members, are really impacted by gun violence. They don't feel safe. We have moms and dads coming to us saying, please intervene because we're, we're afraid we're going to lose our son or our child to gun violence. So I want to have this conversation with you today. I want to share what I believe will work and how we can um, intervene in a more holistic healthy fashion, following those public safety models, public health models to uh, bring back the Portland that we know and love. Thank you so much, Sheriff Reese. We're really grateful for you being here and for your participation and leadership at the county level. Um, I, I would like to next, we'll do questions after this. Um, so I wanna make sure that we get an opportunity for all of our guests to speak. And so next, we're really honored to have District Attorney Mike Schmidt here. Um, DA Schmidt kind of was launched into the middle of this in August, 2020, when he um, took the role earlier than expected and has been you know, a courageous leader across um, our city. And so uh, DA Schmidt, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, representatives, for, for hosting this. Uh, and uh, I got some background noise here because the kids are running around. We're getting ready for Halloween. We're all excited about that. Uh, so <laughs> hopefully uh, that doesn't uh, interrupt too much. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just want to start by, by saying, um, you know, when we, we started off with the names uh, that were listed, uh, and that's a list that is maintained and compiled by my office, and it really, um, I'm a big data guy, a lot of you know that, I'm a big data research person, uh, but it really grounds uh, me and I think my office and the work we do in that behind every data point, um, there's a person and there's a family and, uh, and there are victims and communities where uh, the, the effects of this violence uh, really ripple out and, uh, and the sheriff has covered well um, how that uh, destabilizes uh, people's feelings of, of safety and being able to walk uh, the neighborhoods. I remember when I started my campaign, uh, a person, uh, a man, black man with two children, he came up to me and he said, 
and he knew I had kids and he said, Hey, do you feel safe walking in the parks with your kids? And I said, yeah, I do. I love Portland parks. And he said, that's public safety. When I feel like you, that will be public safety. And as Sheriff Reese has already rightly pointed out, we see disproportionately the victims of our gun violence are from the BIPOC community. And that community does not uh, have that sense of safety right now. So, you know, when I see those, that list of names, it's kind of an emotional, uh, you know, feeling that I have, because I know for us in our office, that represents uh, deputy district attorneys going out to the scene at, at two in the morning frequently. It represents victim advocates uh, connecting families with resources. Um, you know, too often, unfortunately, because of the surge that we are facing in our community right now, uh, where uh, law enforcement is working as hard as we can, but we're going from scene to scene to scene. And, uh, and too frequently, we're having to tell victims that we don't have any updates or any new information. Uh, and that is a really uh, challenging place to be both for them and for the folks who, who do this work. So I just want to acknowledge, you know, how how very serious and urgent this is. I also want to ground us, uh, you know, in what is going on in a context. I talk with my peers across the country, uh, district attorneys. I'm in multiple national district attorneys associations, uh, and they represent district attorneys from all stripes, uh, more conservative areas, more progressive areas. And, and I can tell you with almost out exception, um, we are all facing this. Uh, we are facing uh, this uptick uh, across the board. And it's in places that have uh, you know, funded police uh, even more during the last summer and, and some that, that reduced. Um, and I think uh, Commissioner Rubio really did a great job of laying out, you know, we didn't get here overnight. Um, and the pandemic, I think, has definitely, uh, you know, that is a national thing that has affected us all. But it's really kind of unearthed that our social safety systems, our safety net has been threadbare and it's across the board. Uh, and so, you know, the sheriff already pointed out where we're seeing this violence in our community, and it's in the communities where disinvestment uh, has plagued um, us for, for decades. Um, and from my perspective as a prosecutor, you know, too often the people that I see involved in gun violence are the products of children whose parents were formerly incarcerated, um, children who themselves uh, have already uh, experienced, um, you know, uh, been victims of gun violence and now themselves are involved in uh, being perpetrators of, of that violence. Um, and so, you know, it's, it really has come from, uh, you know, decades and decades of decisions. And I'm, I'm heartened by this conversation today because I think we're in a really challenging moment, uh, a moment where we can, uh, where we need to be careful uh, to not uh, overreact and, and backslide into a lot of people say, you know, this is like a, a 1990s moment and, and we need to be careful that we don't go back there. But the conversation that I hear uh, from our leaders, you know, the sheriff, myself, the city, uh, we're all talking about, we, are, we understand that. Uh, we understand that we can't arrest and prosecute our way out of this, nor do we want to. Uh, law enforcement is a crucial component in a continuum of a response uh, that we have to have. And it includes things from greening spaces, making front end investments in those social safety net things. I read an article in the local uh, paper I have behind me, the, the local Southeast B. Uh, that, that talked about PBOT putting out barrels and making roads be uh, available only to local access and, and the residents saying that that has decreased gun violence on their streets adjacent to uh, the parks around Tabor. Uh, so, you know, I think this is a time where we recognize that this is, we got to be throwing all hands around deck. We all have to come at this collaboratively. Uh, the sheriff and I, we play our role but we know we can't do this alone uh, and that we need uh, every solution uh, on the board. And, and we are playing our role. Um, many of you know, I have a dashboard up on our website. We've got more gun prosecutions uh, happening in this past year than we've ever had before, uh, but we're still, we're reactive. Um, by the time my office is involved, the shell casings are on the ground and somebody's injured or killed. And so that's important. We play a piece, but if we're gonna get ahead of this, uh, we can't backslide to uh, some of the mistakes we've made in the past. We need to have everybody uh, all hands on deck. And, and like Commissioner Rubio said, it's not an either or, it's a both and. Uh, and we need to do everything we can to make sure that we're getting in front of this uh, issue. So look forward to the conversation. 
Um, thank you so much, District Attorney Schmidt. Um, this is a, a, a good segue. As many of you know, I'm a pediatrician and it, you know our work is all about prevention, whether it's giving vaccines or screening for developmental um, disabilities at the, at the one year checkup. Um, and it's really clear that an upstream or upriver um, approach is, is necessary um, to do all we can to, to prevent and to, to, to prevent gun violence among those who are at highest risk. So I'm really honored this morning um, that um, uh, the executive director and founder of Ward is Bond, Lakayana Drury, is here. And I will now um, turn the floor over to him for him to share his story and the work of his organization. Thank you, Lakayana. Thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, Representative Reynolds and Representative Dexter for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be here amongst uh, elected officials and community members. Um, co-founder and executive director of the nonprofit Word is Bond. Um, our mission is to rewrite the narrative between young Black men in law enforcement, but I would say even bigger than that, it's about uh, empowering young Black men to, to be part of the conversations around community safety in the, in the greater Portland metro area. Um, our organization has, has worked with, uh, with uh, Sheriff Reese and the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office. We've worked with uh, D.A. Schmidt uh, and their office as well to, to be part of these conversations. Um, and my inspiration for helping create this organization was based on my own experience growing up as a young Black man. I grew up in Wisconsin. I've been here for five years. Um, when I came here, I, I taught at Rosemary Anderson High School. There's four campuses. It's a, it's a private school and it's also an alternative school. Um, 70 percent of the students are students of color. And that is a direct correlation um, with the fact that they're at an alternative school, right? Because we know Portland Public Schools are, are predominantly white spaces. Um, and when I think about, well, what I saw my first year as a teacher there uh, was, was not surprising at all. That school could have been in Wisconsin for as much as it was here. Um, what I saw was talented, bright, young people of color who lacked the structures, family and otherwise, to be as successful as they, as they could be. And I, I saw students who were very similar to myself, who were so talented, but didn't believe that they were capable because they had been shown for so many years that, that they were not worthy of education or time even in their lives. And so when I think about gun violence in Portland, I think that to narrow it down to an issue of just gun violence is to miss the larger context. And several of the speakers have already mentioned it, but if we're going to talk about gun violence, we have to frame it in the right context which is an overall issue of a crisis, uh, uh, investment crisis in Portland. But as people have pointed out, it's, it's national. Um, I look at gun violence in three categories as I look at the people who've been killed over the last year. You've obviously got the communities of color who have experienced the brunt end of it, but you also have a, a connection with mental and behavioral health and also the houseless community as well. And all three of those populations are, are the systems that are supposed to support them are underinvested at a, at a level that is so high that we are seeing gun violence as the most visible form of violence that is, that is coming out. But there are so many more forms that we, we might not see, right? Whether it's domestic violence, whether it's theft, whether it's uh, just fights, or, or even the, the traumatizing experience of a student of color in the education system. So you have to understand that gun violence is just the, 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 the most visible piece of it and the most threatening one because it, it involves so many people. But I think if we're going to, we, if we are going to fix gun violence in Portland, or even if you wanna say nationally, we have to look at investing in our communities. I'm gonna speak predominantly from my experience in the communities of color, but you could expand it to the other communities that I mentioned as well. 
I think the second point, okay, so we say we say gun violence, we understand that it's larger than just gun violence, right? Gun violence is an, is an outcome of other issues, right? So if we just say we're going to attack gun violence, then we're not actually going to solve it. And that's why we are still here where we were 30 years ago, right? Because we're reaching numbers that we hit in 1987 when we had 70 deaths. But all that means is we're just back to where we were before. So when people say, well, let's, we've got to return to how we did things before, those solutions didn't work. We're, we're back. We're, and not only are we back, we're now even at a, at, a, at a worse, we've surpassed those numbers. So if we just continue to say it's gun violence, we're missing the picture. And then after we say it's gun violence, the second thing we say is police. And that issue where policing is the focus of gun violence also misses the larger issue. Communities of color don't need more police. What we need is investment in schools, in housing, in education. I'm looking at everybody's screen who's got a video on right now. Everybody appears to be living in a house. If I go to the students that I taught at Rosemary Anderson High School, 99% of them are living in apartments. That leads to gun violence. How many of you on this call had one teacher who looked like you from kindergarten to 12th grade? From the screens that I see on, I'm sure it's, it's multiple people every year. I had one black teacher, kindergarten through 12th grade. That has a huge outcome on what people are capable of doing and, and, and what we turn away from, right? So basically what I'm saying is if we, you needed a thousand police officers if you have no investment in your community. But the more programs you have for youth, for families, the less reliance we need on this top heavy law enforcement uh, centered approach, right? And I've taught students here that they don't, they don't see teachers that look like them. They don't have a curriculum that reflects their needs or their reality. And so then we're surprised when we, when we see kids turning to gangs or turning to gun violence because there's, there, is, there is no real plan or future for their success. And I question deeply whether we as a country truly care. The numbers do not suggest it. What's happening in Portland, I'm glad people pointed this out, is not unique to Portland, but it's, it's happening here as it's happening as much as anywhere else. And so just to wrap up my closing thoughts, education, jobs, and housing, there is no replacement for those. And those directly tie into what we're seeing in gun violence, but gun violence is just part of it. The education system, as I said, is just as traumatizing. Growing up in, in public housing and in apartments is just, is just as traumatizing and leads to similar outcomes. And if you don't die by a gun, you die by uh, a lack of opportunity. There's no, we're not creating opportunity for our youth, for our communities to heal. The same thing can be said for the behavior and mental health community. How are we actually helping them deal with substance abuse or helping them get back on their feet or, or find the supports to deal with their behavioral health? How are we helping the houseless community get out of a cycle of just camping on the street or in a tent or sleeping on the ground? And until we invest in those issues, we're going to be chasing the tail end of it, which is the, the outcome. And if you start with gun violence as the tipping point, you've you've already lost the conversation. So um, I put together a plan. I, I'll share the link uh, with the administrators here, but I put together a plan called the Rose City Investment Plan. And it's a, it's a, it's a plan that looks at both uh, short-term strategies, right? Because we do have to stem gun violence as it is now, but we also have to, more importantly, look upstream to those other pieces. So those are, those are some of my initial thoughts. Um, thank you for having me. Wow, um, thank you so much, Mr. Drury. Um, and uh, yes, please please share that plan with us. We will be doing a, a follow-up email to everyone on this call and we will include that plan. And um, your words are very powerful. And of course, of course you're right. And um, I think everyone on this on this call agrees with you, you know, as as um, uh, our district attorney said, you know, once he's involved and the, the shells are on the ground, it's it's obviously way too late. 
So all the upstream efforts are, are really important. I think it's what we, we all are very interested in here. We, we now have some time for uh, questions and answers. We are opening up the chat. Uh, we ask, of course, that you be respectful in the questions you're asking and, and, and who you're directing it to. Um, I will, uh, um, I will, I would love to hear, um, I would love to hear actually, um, Makayana, if you don't mind, or Mr. Dury, if you don't mind, can you share a little bit of, of what you're, the actual nuts and bolts of what you're doing in Word is Bond and, and how that's been impactful? Yeah, so when we started Word is Bond as a, it was a group of community members who came together right after um, the shootings in 2017 of unarmed black people. And then as well as there were some shootings in like uh, Texas with officers and they wanted to create a program to, 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 to create uh, connections and positive relationships. So I came in um, to help write the curriculum and kind of get us uh, off the ground. And so our, we have a six week summer internship program and every Tuesday of those six weeks, a group of officers uh, joins our youth. We have about uh, 15 of them every summer from all across Portland, young black men specifically. And they host, they, they participate in a series of workshops, um, starting with just interpersonal conversation and then slowly over the next weeks, delving into the deeper issues of race and trauma and things of those nat that nature. Um, the officers come out of uniform and it's in a, a, a safe, neutral space. I say safe because to say that the space is safe is a misnomer because I, I can do everything I can to make the space safe, but for me to just say it's a safe space would be like to say we're all equal in this country. It's a great thing to think in theory, but it doesn't actually take in the reality of the power dynamics and other things. So that's part of it, right? But then th throughout the other days of the week when they're not with officers, they're learning about the government systems in Portland. They're learning about public safety. They have a law week where they go to the county courthouse and the district attorney's office and talk and have conversations around that. They do tours of Portland. I see it as like a, an alternative form of education that kind of adds on to what they're not getting in school, in the school system um, as a whole. And really focusing, like we unapologetically focus on the needs of young black men. This is not an organization for every BIPOC youth or every youth of color that's had a challenge in their life. And it doesn't even specifically focus just on young black men that have been incarcerated. We have students at Jesuit, at public schools, at alternative schools, and it shows the rich diversity of experiences of young black men. Because when we say, oh, we serve young black men, they're like, well, what about everybody else? Or, or that's so narrow of a focus. But it's like, when you, when you meet the young men in our program, not any two of them are the same. And it's a huge misnomer to believe that all young black men's experiences are, are similar. Some have had extreme conflict with law enforcement. Some have had no conflict at all. Um, but our program, it, it, it comes from a lot of it. It comes from my own experience growing up where I never saw a program just for me as a young black man. And our needs are not better than anybody else's, but they are unique. And so by having Word is Bond, we are focusing, that's what equity looks like, right? If you go to a clothing store, they don't just have a one size fits all pair of shoes or, or clothes, right? They have different colors, different sizes for, for different people. And that's, that is, that's what we want, right? And so that's what Word is Bond is. Word is Bond is that clothing size for young black men. And it's not to say that other people's issues aren't as equal or, or different, but it's to say that we are focusing on this particular group and we are gonna do it well. So that's the focus of our program. We also do mentoring. We have a second year internship program that they do offsite internships. So one of our interns was at um, Mike Schmidt's office. He, he's 19 years old. He was the youngest intern on their staff team this summer and the only one that was not in law school. And for a young black man to have that kind of experience is critical, right? Because we wanna put them in job positions that are going to further their opportunity in the future. We can't just send all of them to McDonald's and Arby's for summer jobs. I wanna put them into 
professional experiences that they couldn't normally just walk off the street and get to give them that experience at young ages so that they can get those middle class jobs so that they can be in houses like I'm seeing on these screens right now, right? We can't have a model where it's just everybody's just working dead end jobs and living in apartments. If you wanted to end gun violence, the same way they were, someone was saying earlier, when you build housing, when you create jobs, those numbers go down. People don't turn to gun violence because they just have nothing better to do. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's comes down to a deprivity of a situation where I'm in an extreme situation. This is, this is all I know. So that's a little bit about our program and the work we do. Mr. Dury, I cannot imagine I speak for just myself when I say how much I appreciate the work that you're doing, the passion that you bring, and the focus on this community, this appropriate um, per focus. Um, and we are really trying to build opportunities um, of influence at the state level, and I'm sure at every level. So please send us any individuals interested in internships. We have space for them at our office and I know Rep Reynolds does in many other offices as well. So let's work together um, from today forward, making sure that those internships and, and opportunities open doors. Um, and I just wanna follow up on that um, with Cheryl's question about what can we do to actively support the work of Word is Bond in the Rose City Investment Plan? That's the million dollar question. Um, spreading the word, um, helping us uh, connect us with larger funding sources. Um, we're, we're hiring staff right now to do the work, right? Like everybody wants to fund the youth directly or this part of the program, but it's like, there's only, there's two staff in Words Bond right now, right? And one of them is an administrative manager and we're hiring um, a program manager. But if we want to engage more youth, we have to have staff on the ground that are able to work with them, right? Like we can't, you, you know, for every staff, they can maybe serve 15, 20 youth maximum. So I think that is part of it, helping us just spread our, our message. Um, advocating, it, when you look at the Rose City Investment Plan, at advocating, using your privilege, your power as white people, it's, it's one thing for five black family members to go to a school board and say, hey, we need a more diverse curriculum. But it's a whole nother thing for the white community to throw their support behind it and demand that their school systems and that their elected officials look at the larger issues. And when we just keep coming back to police, 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 more police, more police, say, no, we also need housing. Police can't just be our only response. You have got to get these people houses. We can't just build 20 new apartment complexes that have murals outside of them. We need real houses. We need real jobs. We can't just create, uh, you know, whatever it is. And so throwing your weight behind that and demanding it and not just leaving it to students to walk out of school and to demand justice or leave it to someone to get shot and everybody shows up at the, the vigil and, and says some words. But there, I think there's a lot of power um, and weight that can be thrown behind it and to demand that our, our city and our country as a whole um, cares about other people. Because when I look at it, I don't really believe we care. I know what caring looks like. I know what white people look like when they care about issues that impact them. I know how they show up. I know how they vote. I know how they move. I don't see that truly. I see more of an understanding than I ever have, but it's, it's, it's not there enough. And I don't think anybody in a, an elected position can sit back and say, we are doing our absolute best job. Like until we have really seen shifts in numbers and culture, everybody has to keep their foot on the gas and say, this is not enough. This small victory that we might've gotten in and of itself is not enough. Word is bond is great. We're doing some good work, but it's like that in and of itself cannot be the end all be all solution. And I think also government plays a huge role. We can't nonprofit our way out of this either. We can't de depend on just well-meaning citizens and nonprofits to do the job or the, the support of the government, which is to make sure people have a high standard of living. And the reality is for most Portlanders of color, the standard of living is unacceptable of what they're allowed to live in, what they're the schools that they're allowed to go to, the curriculums that they're allowed to learn, and the, the tremendous cliff that they fall off of when they go out of high school, there's no plan for them. 
So the Rose City Investment Plan and other ideas like that are about investing long-term so people have the same opportunities as a lot of us on this call have had. Wow, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Jury. Um, I'm in a, uh, really grateful for that. And I think a lot of uh, food for thought for a lot of us who, who, who know we can show up better and, and more authentically. And uh, we look forward to seeing that plan. And um, I certainly echo Rep Dexter's invitation. We'd love to have um, folks uh, come down to Salem and play a meaningful role in our um, offices. Uh, we do have a question. This is directed at Sheriff Reese, but I think it could also go to um, the district attorney. And we know that um, the sheriff's office, local police, and surrounding agencies have started collaborating in the last few months. And how, how, what does that collaboration look like? And is the effort starting to have an impact uh, on the levels of gun violence in our community? Yeah, thank you for the question. That's a, a really important question to ask. And before I get to it, I just want to say uh, thank you to Lakiana. Um, he has been wonderful to work with at the sheriff's office. Remember that first meeting where we played basketball and uh, got to meet a lot of the young people in your program and that connection uh, between our deputy sheriffs and uh, young black males in our community is really important to building trust and a long-term relationship. And I couldn't agree more with him that we've got to get upstream and ask ourselves why particularly kids of color don't see hope in school, don't see opportunities in employment and in housing that other people in our community see. And we are uh, fundamentally not meeting their needs and uh, leaving ourselves open to having the same conversation again when we have another pandemic or another time of disorder and chaos and then we fracture. And that's what I think we're seeing right now with gun violence in our community. I wanna talk a little bit about the trends because it'll provide a little context on what the sheriff's office and our partners are doing. Gun violence is um, impacting our communities in different ways. There's gang and group violence where we see these affiliations between people and they're um, interacting in a very violent way with firearms. Often uh, high capacity magazines with uh, 30, 40, 50 shell casings at a scene. You have domestic violence where, you know, there's a firearm in that uh, volatile mix and someone is threatened or loses their life in a domestic violence incident. You've got people at extreme risk. Um, those folks who are a risk to themselves or others, and we need to take action to take firearms out of that situation. And then we've got criminal acts that are committed with firearms, assaults and robberies and things of that nature. At the sheriff's office, uh, we really started uh, much like uh, DA Schmidt's office, we look at the data and we let that inform our decision-making where to put resources. In uh, early 2020, you know, that um, late spring, early summertime, we saw the gun violence starting to accelerate. And it isn't just the city of Portland, it's the surrounding areas in Gresham, in East County cities like Fairview and Wood Village and Troutdale, in Clark County. So what happens in Portland impacts the entire uh, region. A lot of the gun violence is between groups, people affiliated together. Uh, they're, um, you know, it's not like it was back in the uh, late 80s and 90s where it was about turf or um, criminal operations. This is more about um, just negative interactions between people. And we're not going to stop every negative interaction between 16 to 25 year old males. What we can do is take firearms out of the mix and uh, do everything we can to reduce the number of firearms in our community that are possessed illegally. So folks that shouldn't have a gun, shouldn't have high capacity magazines um, taking that, that violent step. At the Sheriff's Office, we partnered uh, back in the spring of 2021 with the Gresham Police Department, the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Office of Violence Prevention at the City of Portland, Healing Hurt People, and other service providers in a really holistic effort to stop the violence in East County, to work um, with partner agencies to intervene quickly and effectively to share information 
so that we could understand what was driving gun violence in our community and really um, respond quickly and effectively to those incidents. We also know that we do need right now to act with a sense of urgency. As we work upstream, we've also got to intervene and we need to intervene right now. Some of that intervention is police officers and deputy sheriffs in that really dangerous space where people are trying to shoot each other. You've got to have police officers and deputies that are willing to put their lives on the line for this community, taking firearms out of that mix. Uh, we have deputy sheriffs assigned to a gun dispossession unit. So when we have a restraining order that uh, a victim of domestic violence has had served, we want to, the judge has said that, uh, that violent person involved in this relationship should be dispossessed to their firearms. We have a sergeant that leads a team that takes those firearms out of that mix. They also work on the extreme risk protective orders as well. There are other uh, things that we need to do as we work with our partners. Certainly I'll let Mike talk about the investigative side of things, but we have in dedicated investigators in East County that work all of the gun violence events. So we investigate every single shooting that happens in East County and in the city of Gresham. And we share that information with partners at the Office of Violence Prevention so that they can do de-escalation within the communities they work with. And then the district attorney's office can work with us in holding people accountable. Yeah. Uh just to, to augment what the sheriff said, he covered a lot of it, um, but we're, we have been now, um, I mean, early on, uh, the sheriff has been a great leader in the space in his entire career, uh, but we were a year ago uh, meeting out in Gresham and having, you know, all law, law enforcement agencies uh, present so we could share information, strategize. So we've been, we've really been working on this, you know, like he said, since we've seen the data uh, increasing. And uh, that looks like, practically, that looks like um, weekly shooting reviews where we're coming across with all the agencies coming together in one space, sharing information on cases. Um, that allows us to make connections. Uh, when we are testing bullet shell casings, when we're testing guns, uh, we can determine and we can see that we're seeing the same gun show up at one, two, three, four, up to seven different scenes sometimes. And we can start to put those pieces together, even though, and as the sheriff's already said, well, you know, shootings know no jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, and so it's crucial that we're getting together uh, as frequently as we can, even in a time when we're doing it remotely uh, because of social distancing and everything else. Uh, but sharing that information across agencies. And I think that has been uh, very successful. Uh, as I've uh, you know, already noted, you can go on our website, the mcda.us, uh, and look at a dashboard, shows you the types of cases we're prosecuting. You can see that we're making more prosecutions right now uh, than we have uh, ever before. And that's not because uh, the district attorney's office can do it alone. That's everybody working together uh, to make those cases. Um, you know, from our office, what it looks like uh, leading a lot of investigations, especially where there are homicides uh, and working, of course, with our partners at the U.S. Attorney's Office to do the same. Uh, and, uh, you know, that means for my deputies um, getting called out in the middle of the night, uh, showing up at the scene to assist uh, detectives and other law enforcement that are there, uh, helping write warrants uh, so that we can do investigations, talking to witnesses. Uh, and trying to, to put together cases that are prosecutable. Uh, the sheriff's had some great successes taking massive hauls of guns off the streets. Uh, as he said, that's a crucial component um, because what we see is, um, you know, a lot of the things that I've seen over this past year, I've seen, you know, people getting killed over uh, things that, that just are not worth losing somebody's life over, uh, you know, a, a road raging incidents. I've seen fights over over um, parking spaces. I mean, just when when guns are in the mix and are readily available, um, people can end up dead. And uh, and so uh, even things that traditionally you wouldn't think would end up in, in somebody's death, um, the more and more guns are, are flowing on our streets, the more and more opportunity there is for somebody for that to be a lethal interaction as opposed to just uh, an angry one. Uh, so that's a big uh, key component for law enforcement. The other thing that the district attorney's office is really doing, and I'm very, um, you know, grateful to the county commission for supporting our office and adding 
uh, four new prosecutors with the stimulus funds, as, uh, as well as two investigators, uh, is that we can, uh, you know, also look a little bit deeper in terms of, uh, you know, the sheriff talked about prevention. There's, you know, we, we got to get upstream and, and what Lakiana is talking about, like structural prevention, all of that. But there is a role for law enforcement uh, prevention, sharing information. We work with parole and probation so that when we know if somebody's involved in shooting, uh, that we can uh, work with their probation officer to, to bring them in uh, right away and, and have a conversation about what's going on and if they violated their parole probation. That is a, a lever to uh, to pull sometimes to to um, you know stop the immediate uh, risk of somebody uh, shooting in our community. So we work very closely with all of the the different levels, and sometimes that means you know having those extra prosecutorial resources will mean uh, that we're able to make connections that we wouldn't otherwise be able to make. Uh, and so putting together cases uh, both in our jurisdiction and and with our partner jurisdictions. Uh, across the region um, is also a crucial component to what we can do to intervene uh, and, and really kind of stop the bleeding uh, at that point. Thank you so much. Um, I, I really appreciate what I'm hearing in the answer to this question that there really are efforts of cross um, collaboration. And I also wanted to kind of link that with one of the questions that Sherry asked about um, Commissioner Rubio's statement that there were only a few thousand dollars to add to parks and green spaces in underserved areas. I know our ARPA dollars that Rep Reynolds and I um, both have invested as well as what the city and the county have received are going, as you just stated, into investments such as for your um, prosecuting staff and, and investigators. Um, I think that the upriver um, investments are key. We know that the return on those investments are much higher than, you know, trying to squash um, the the perpetrators after they've already fallen into this. Like we really need to try to prevent people to Mr. Drury's point of falling into these ways. Nobody chooses um, violence as a way to live their life unless they feel hopeless and no other options are present. So um, I'd like to ask um, Rep Reynolds and I, and, and also um, we have Commissioner Stegman here and um, Akasha Lawrence Spence, who also is an amazing leader in our community, to talk about East County and, and where do we think the most valuable or, or highest yield investments are. I do think um, bringing pride to a community, bringing um, public spaces that are safe and beautiful, like parks, are um, really key, um, but also the blight that we are seeing and, and the um, buildings that are are being neglected. Like, how can we work together to carry on this into this interconnectedness um, as a community to um, to kind of break down the jurisdictions that exist? I think that like, whether it's um, zoning or other things, we we really have challenges. So I would really appreciate um, Commissioner Stegman if you're willing um, to help us um, discuss that. And I will just say that you know we are investing in parks, and I'll. I'll ask um, Rep Reynolds to say something while I'm checking in with um, Commissioner Stegman to make sure she's okay with me calling on her. I know, thank you, Commissioner Stegman for maybe um, commenting on this, but um, yes, absolutely. I think this is an important, important topic. And I think this is where I think there's some really tangible upstream services that we can provide. Sorry, and, and Commissioner, I am having a hard time um, messaging you quickly enough. Um, do you want to just jump in? And if not, um, Akasha, no, thoughts? And I am unmuting Commissioner Stegman. Okay, she may not be immediately available. Um, okay, I can say something really quickly. Um, thank please. you so much, um, Rep. Dexter and Rep. Reynolds for um, hosting this incredibly important conversation. Um, also, thank you to uh, Sheriff Reith and, and uh, DA Mike Schmidt, and of course, Lakiana for the work you're doing in community. And I think part of what, you know, Lakiana said is, is hugely a part of my platform and the things that I believed in and fought for is, um, you know, looking at economic justice, right? Like, 
it, when we think about the reasons that people turn to um, crime or are looking like or feel as though they have no other um, route um, with which to express themselves or or uh, gain access to opportunity um you know we like like lakiana said it, it starts with um, a stable and resilient community right it starts with stable housing um it starts with being able to have access to stable food it starts with being able to have access to opportunity and and not feel consigned to living a life on the margins right not feeling consigned to living a life in which you can't have the same level of participation that you see around you there's a lot of prosperity in portland um, we know that, you know, during the pandemic, there are a lot of people who made a lot of money, but there are many more of us who are struggling and living in survival mode. And so what what that does is it, you know, we're seeing it across the nation. It's not just ende endemic to Portland. It's endemic all over this country it, throughout um, when people are, you know, turning to these other modes of expression because they aren't being taken care of. And so it's, you know, when we think about upstream solutions, we have to think about the fact that we do live in the richest nation in the world and we have people who are sleeping in tents. That, that is another form of violence that happens when folks are, are literally sharing, uh, fighting over territory, fighting over places to sleep and exist and are um, unable to find a stable place to live, um, unable to find the resources to um, get on their feet and to take care of themselves. And it's not just folks who are, um, you know, not experiencing substance abuse and mental illness. We have folks who are working 40 hours a week and are still living on the streets. And so when you're a young person and you see that you can put in all this sweat equity and come out with nothing, um, it, it give, can create nihilism, right? And so I think it's up to us to really think about how we engage in our communities and what we, what we show folks is possible. Um, and, you know, providing those resources, um, bolstering um, small business creation in our communities, right? Um, providing resources such that when folks come home for reentry, they're not feeling like they have to go beg for a job, but they see um, places that they can be a part of and contribute to their communities um, in their communities, that they don't have to leave their communities for opportunity. That is crucial, right? To feel like there is a place to grow and to own and to be a part of something within your community that you don't always have to go downtown, that you don't have to go to a, a white dominated area to find opportunity, that it exists right in your own backyard. And so those investments that you talk about, not only in having, you know, increasing green spaces, which we know has helped to mitigate crime, but also um, thinking about even the constraints of parole, right? Like D.A. Schmidt talked about the fact that oftentimes folks are, um, you know, have on parole, so they're in, in a re-entry program, but they're they're entrenched in crime, right? Because what are their options? Parole costs money, right? You get out of jail and you're expected to pay for that. You're expected to pay for your restitution. And we know that um, being somebody who's been previously incarcerated depresses your income over your lifetime, um, you know, in, in drastic ways. And you're indebted to the state. So, you know, a lot of the policies that we've been, um, you know, looking at on the state level and on the county level of, you know, not creating the burden of parole, not creating these debt burdens that feel insurmountable and giving folks a real opportunity to grow and to find roots and to be resilient and, and find economic stability within their own communities. And I think somebody in the chat talked about you know, the role that this plays um, in our education system and what they're doing to prepare youth. But the, one of the things that we do know is that having um, a parent who has been previously incarcerated um, drastically decreases your ability to um, stay in school without suspension and to graduate. And when we have rates of, of um, African-Americans and black people in the state of Oregon being incarcerated at a rate 480% times higher than the statewide average, we're consigning this community to generational harm and these generational impacts. So yes, it's, it's um, you know, something that I think is, is, has grown pre post pandemic that we're still living in, but it's, it's something that is um, more long-term. And like everyone has said on this call already, it, it's gonna take um, upstream and downstream solutions um, and really economic stability in these communities to, to really change the, the course. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Lawrence Spence. So uh, 
who is a candidate for um, the Senate appointment for Senate District 18. Um, we do have um, County Commissioner Sharon Myron, who's also a physician. I know there's a nod to the fact that there are three elected physicians here. We also have um, Dr. Steiner Hayward uh, as a state senator. Um, but I am going to ask if Sharon Myron can can comment on the role of the local public health, such as Multnomah County, of course, um, Health Department, uh, working with um, working with the Portland Office of Violence Prevention and, and Community Safety, and, and how that plays in. And going back to the theme that opened this topic by Rep. Dexter about gun violence prevention as a public health issue. So. I think um, Commissioner Myron, you have to do a star six from the phone. And if that doesn't work, I could almost guess her answer, but I won't. Um, Sharon, feel free to, to chime in if you're able to. Um, I think I think as we're getting near the end of our 90 minutes together, it's very clear we could probably spend another couple hours on this topic. Um, and I see some nice comments by um, our DA, uh, Mike Schmidt and, and Sheriff Reese. Why don't we- uh, Sorry, Rep oh, Reynolds, I'm gonna jump in. I just yes. have um, <laughs> yes. Commissioner Myron on the phone. So she's Great. just gonna talk here. <laughs> <laughs> Great. This, this is, like, for your craziness of technology, I don't know if this is working and and I'll only take a minute, but- um, People just, can hear you, you're good. Can they, okay, awesome. And uh, I just, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Lauren Spence, candidate for uh, State Senate and uh, also um, everyone on this call. This has been incredible. I uh, was, just particularly lucky on your um, your words and sheriff i i appreciated your um talking about the holistic approach in east county uh but i i really want to emphasize how the county must be uh, a partner in all of the work that is happening here and is a partner and has to lean in even further and uh i want to go back to some of what lakiana mentioned about the mental health and behavioral health aspect of this being so important and elevate the partnership and the work, the work that Rosemary Anderson and POIC and Joe McFerrin are doing and that we are partnering with to bring forward in mental health, which is um, innovative, uh, entirely brilliant approaches and with violence prevention and how essential that is, that partnership. We need that holistic approach to be taken, the upstream and downstream aspects, not only in East County with Gresham Police and that, that work that is happening, but holistically, including Portland. And I just, uh, this, there is so much work to do, but I am inspired by this conversation and want to uh, emphasize what a partner the county is and wants to be even further in this work. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I really don't wanna spend um, much of our time making statements. I feel like I've spoken plenty, but I am here for this conversation. I'm here for the work. Um, I welcome everyone to challenge me and, and inspire me and, and bring me to the table. But I also feel like we really need to do our work to bring the communities that are impacted, the communities who aren't represented, the people without power to the table. And I am dedicated to doing that. And with that, I'll pass it on to Rep Reynolds, and then we'll continue to um, move on to our guests for your closing statements. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, yes, thank you, Rep. Dexter. Yes, thank you all for being here and spending your morning. I think I will um, I will take my closing moment just to talk a, a minute on Portland Street response, which is something that's been alluded to a few times, but this is where we send out mobile crisis units uh, uh, for, for folks who are in crisis, and this can include people in a mental health crisis and an addiction crisis, um, or, or just homeless people um, 
struggling particularly hard. Uh, the pilot program in Lentz, Lentz Park has been, or in the Lentz neighborhood has been, um, has shown to be very, very effective. And I am really grateful to hear Carmen mm -hmm. Rubio's commitment um, as a city commissioner to expanding this further. I think this is, these are the type of solutions we need. This is part of a holistic approach um, to violence. But of course, more importantly, I'm, I'm really excited, excited about the upstream services like uh, Mr. Jury explained. Um, just doing, I'm gonna do, uh, ask uh, Commissioner Reese to do a closing statement and then um, DA, DA Schmidt and then Mr. Jury, thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Reynolds and uh, Representative uh, Dexter for hosting this really great conversation and for all of you for participating. When I look around uh, the gallery, I see um, people who care deeply about the safety of our city and see hope in it as well and want to uh, make sure that we're doing everything possible to create that sense of safety, trust, and belonging that we all need. Uh, I want to just uh, close by saying that we can't, it's something Mike uh, Schmidt said earlier, our district attorney, can't go back to what we were doing in the 90s and expect different results as we move forward. Um, the police made mistakes. Uh, I wanna acknowledge that and say, I'm sorry uh, that we didn't look at um, how we were policing, it, particularly in BIPOC communities, um, in, in how we were building and developing relationships. Um, we fractured trust in some of the things we did. As we move forward, as police officers and deputy sheriffs intervene in this uh, violence, we have to do it um, with strategies that are defensible and supported by the communities that are impacted by the violence. And um, you have my commitment to work as hard as possible to keep the peace for everyone in our community and to work with our community members to ensure that our safety and security, whether it's in the city of Portland, in East County, or in our neighboring communities, that we're doing everything possible to do it in a way that builds trust in our public safety professionals. Thank you. Yeah. And uh... Echo the sheriff, uh, thank you for having this conversation. Somebody made this uh, comment in the chat, uh, but it is great to see so many doctors in the house. Uh, that's fantastic uh, because, you know, we have been saying for a while, you know, that this is a, we need a health response. Uh, and so, you know, I, I put it in the chat, but I'm, I'm very grateful to a group of doctors from across our health institutions of our community are joining my office and we're going through cases uh, and we're looking at them. And, and the idea is to decide, are there opportunities? Look, I mean, we've been prosecuting cases the same way for the last couple hundred years. Uh, you know, it, we do the same thing and, and that's our role. That's our job. We collect evidence uh, and then we determine whether or not there are charges that we can file and we file those charges. But where are we missing opportunities? Because what we're seeing, I think, is that sometimes our systems are at cross purposes. Uh, I've talked to doctors who are working with patients and, and having good results, but then an arrest or a probation violation can take them off of the path to recovery. Uh, and, it, and we'll never know about that. So how do, we, uh, how do we break down some of those barriers? So I'm very excited to see where this work leads of just having conversations about our work and considering where there are intersections. So grateful to the doctors uh, that are on this uh, because we need your help. And, and as a sheriff already said, uh, we know that we can't uh, prosecute, we can't arrest our way out of this. Uh, this is all hands on deck. And uh, man, uh, Director Jury, that guy, he knows what he's talking about. I am every time impressed uh, with everything he says. So, and that's what it takes. Um, so super supportive. So thanks for the conversation uh, and uh, we'll keep at it. Yeah, y'all can just call me Lakiana. Um, but I, I wanna just thank everybody for, for being here today. Uh, for Representative Dexter and Reynolds for hosting this conversation. And I think that there is tremendous um, power in this group, right? As most of the folks in here are, are white and, and have that power. And then there's, there's doctors and district attorneys and, and all sorts of folks that can, that can push us in the direction that we want to go. And I don't think it's about money and I don't think it's about resources. We have, the, we have all of it to do it if we want to. And if it's not being done, the answer should speak for itself. 
Um, I, I would also like to say we have to support folks like DA Schmidt, like to have a district attorney. We've never had a district attorney like him in, in Portland. And that, and, and not only that, like they, um, taking that direction, us in a new direction, as far as how we are prosecuting people is exactly what we need. There is not enough support for his work, right? Like if we are going to change the system, we're going to have to push a system that doesn't want to change. And so when we get gifts like DA Schmidt in office, we have to support their work because yeah, people aren't gonna wanna change things, but it's like, if we don't, we're going to end up in the same way that we are now. That's why it's also important to have law enforcement elected officials like Sheriff Reese, who acknowledge that we have a problem and that acknowledge the historical harm that has been done. But we can't just undo it by new political agendas. We also have to do it by doing the groundwork. So as you all are going to have conversations and people are talking about gun violence, I would challenge you to say, hey, the bigger issue is investment in these communities and help people frame what the issues are and that it's not just gun violence. Gun violence is the outcome, but it starts way down below. And we do have to do upstream solutions and solutions right now, but they have to be done at the same time and in a priority on those upstream solutions too, because they have never been actually done. And there has to be a fierce urgency, right? Our houses aren't on fire, but the houses of our community members are on. So we can't wait, oh, you know, it needs to be done now. And there needs to be a strong sense of urgency. And there's a critical role that our white community members of privilege and power have the opportunity to demand that our elected officials and everybody who has a piece in this do the work that they need to be done. Jobs, education, and housing. There's no substitute for those. So that's what I would say is where we need to go today. Thank you for having me. And I, I think that's a perfect final word, um, unless <laughs> Rep. Dexter wants to say something. Thank no, you all for, here, here. for sharing your morning with us. Um, there will be more to come on this topic. Thank you all.